Hey everyone, and welcome to another Kanoa Reviews, where we review games both new and old on all platforms. If you like the content that I make, then please subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell so you never miss a review when it comes out. Today we talk about Hitman 3, which was recently released, and will be the end of the Hitman trilogy reboot, and also the last Hitman for quite a while, according to the developers, as their next project will be a James Bond game. Hitman is of course the game series that revolves around stealth in the form of hiding in plain sight by tracking down and taking out a target while blending in the environment amongst regular people and going into places only specific staff or security is allowed by stealing and putting on the clothes of those who have authority to go there. Now it might come as a surprise to some viewers, but I actually have a great love for the Hitman series and would maybe even consider Hitman Blood Money to be my top 10 favorite games. The very first Hitman game I've ever played was Hitman Contracts, and the reason that I picked this up was in anticipation to Hitman Blood Money. What I saw in magazines about Blood Money had me so excited that I wanted to experience what the Hitman games had to offer, and so my first baptism was with Contracts, which was a great introduction, but since it was on the regular Xbox, it of course could feel a bit empty in comparison to what we got later. There's not a whole lot that I remember from the game. The biggest thing that stands out to me is a level where there's an illegal dance party at a slaughtering house and you need to take out a psychotic chef who comes after you with a cleaver. I hope to one day also review Hitman contracts on the channel as well. Blood Money then was an absolute masterpiece and really set the Hitman franchise to a new height with for the first time having so many civilian NPCs roam around to make you feel like you were in a living and believable world. Having this objective, to assassinate someone in a level that takes place at an opera in Paris while guests are having tours of the area and the staff is working behind the scenes, was such a unique and great atmosphere. Having your own agenda and trying to stay unnoticed by all those people felt incredibly satisfying, as was also the example in the New Orleans level, where you followed a certain target while a big parade was going on outside and hundreds of civilian NPCs were partying not knowing that a handful of people were about to die a horrible death. Then Hitman Absolution came, and everything I saw from the trailers, but also previews and reviews, made it seem like the creators abandoned that sandbox and open-ended feel, and made it way more linear with sections where Agent 47 was being hunted and had to escape, or mechanics which I absolutely hated, like being able to see or hear through walls, something that Hitman absolutely did not need. Because of that, Hitman Absolution was the only Hitman game I've skipped, and I did buy it during a Steam sale once, but have not managed to play it yet. There is actually nowadays a growing cult following who likes this game, and who apparently thinks it's the best Hitman game out of all of them. Again, from everything that I saw, I have to disagree with this, but I've only seen a slither of it, so I hope to one day to review Hitman Absolution and see if it's actually as bad as I think it is, or maybe as good as some people say. But then of course we got Hitman. The reboot and initially released did not come without problems unfortunately, mostly caused by releasing the game episodically per level, which was a big mistake. It took the wins out of its release and also would end up feeling a bit stale if the newest level that was released simply wasn't all that interesting like Marrakesh. However, despite a bumpy start with the episodic release, the gameplay was back to its level and I remember the advertisement slogan by the creators being that this was the Hitman follow-up that fans of Blood Money were waiting for. And they were not wrong. It finally went back to that Blood Money formula, with you going to very large open places with now thousands of civilian NPCs in which you had to blend in and still find your target and now take it out in more possible ways than ever before. Despite the game only having 6 levels, they were some of the largest levels ever in a Hitman game. For those also wondering if I ever played the original Hitman Agent 47, I have. But I played it way after Blood Money, and the style of that game is so much more linear, and in all honesty, I really did not like the first Hitman game, since there's not a lot of freedom, even though in that same year, the first Deus Ex was released. So fast forward a few years later, and we finally have Hitman 3, which is the latest entry in that reboot series. Hitman 1, 2, and 3 each have 6 levels, and follow the same storyline which gets a conclusion with this entry. So let's see if Hitman 3 is worth playing if one has played the previous entries, or if you are dipping your toes for the first time in this franchise. So first let's talk about the story, this has been one of the weaker parts of the Hitman franchise in general, 
but in all honesty, the gameplay to me is so satisfying that they don't need to collude it with stories of companies and shadow corporations pulling the strings behind the scenes or betrayal and revenge. To me, Hitman is just about going to an exotic location and taking out my target. Pure and simple. And that is coming from someone who adores storytelling in video games and thinks it's often very important to have one. But here it just doesn't fit and feels ham-fisted. It's the same with Assassin's Creed, where I believe the first Assassin's Creed is so much better than the second, purely because there's less background story of the main character, Altair. He's an assassin who gets assignments, and all he needs is a target and a direction, and that's that. Personal motivations or background story to shape one's character are not necessary in this case, and can only make it feel sloppy and cheesy. And that is also the case with the main story here in Headman. To be honest, I have seen all the cutscenes from the previous two entries, but I cannot remember for the life of me what the story was about, because it's simply not that interesting. But I do remember a lot of board members and shadowy figures talking to one another, and in that sense I will say that the storytelling in Hitman 3 is a bit more visceral and engaging since it all revolves around Agent 47 instead of the bad guys in the background. Ironically, it has a bit of a James Bond vibe about it, with Agent 47 and a partner in crime going after the same people they had been working for for years, and who used their talents purely for themselves. I was afraid that this personal story of revenge would get in the way of the game feeling like a Hitman game, where you take on assignments, but the game does a very good job of not ham-fisting it too much. The story won't raise any eyebrows, but it's also not bad. It's alright, and does its job at a surface level. And I can then also agree that this game is still very accessible to those new to the franchise, since even though you might miss out on some background stories, the plot of revenge on those who you worked for was easy enough to understand to follow the story. However, it might be a more important question to those new to the franchise if this game is worth experiencing first when it comes to its levels, since that is the absolute core of the awesome Hitman experience. So let's finally talk gameplay that which makes Hitman so enjoyable to me. So how the game works is that you head to an exotic level each time, whether it would be Dubai or Paris or China or Miami, and you need to find one or two targets and take them out in whatever way you see fit. The really cool thing about this and the core of the Hitman experience is that you can do this entirely the way you want. Often the creators talk about how there are sometimes more than 30 ways to kill your target, and they're not wrong. For you see, the target NPCs each have a pattern that they follow, where they walk over the map and perform various actions, whether it's talking to other NPCs or on the phone, going out for a smoke, checking a computer, or leaning over a balcony to catch some fresh air. These target NPCs are often being followed by personal bodyguards, who will shoot at you if you act suspicious, and so ideally, you would want to wait until they have a separate moment for themselves, or maybe you can do something that will split them up. Now if you want to get it over with quick, you can use the silent pistol you have with you at the start of each level and fire at the target when hopefully no one is looking. But that is easier said than done. More often than not, you will have to head through areas where you need to be frisked first, and thus you cannot have any guns on your character unless you smuggle them through somehow. And besides that, it might be difficult to avoid detection by pulling a pistol out if the target's bodyguard is there too. So, if shooting is too much of a hassle, what else can you do? As I said, the target might go and lean over a balcony. If you manage to sneak behind them, you can then push them over the balcony as they fall to their death. This even makes it seem like an accident rather than an execution, which adds to your score. Or remember the smoking I talked about? Maybe near the area, there might be a gas canister, which, if you sabotage it, if you have a wrench in your inventory, you can have the gas leaking out, and the moment the target lights his cigarette, he goes up in a big boom. Or, you could poison his drink or food if the target NPC stops somewhere to take a bite or take a sip. And even there, you have the choice in that you can use lethal poison, which kills him or her right then and there, often amidst a lot of civilians, or have it be non-lethal poison, which will give them stomach cramps and force them to head to the toilet to throw up. You can then drown them in the toilet amongst their own puke, very nasty, but also very funny. And that is only a fraction of ways you can kill the targets that I just mentioned. It really is up to you how you go about this, and the cool thing too is that exploring the giant levels is one of the most important parts in that. As I said, you often only start with a silence pistol and a wire to strangle the target with silently. And from that point on, you need to make your way through the level and the targets are often in areas where regular guests are not allowed. 
so you go ahead and explore. You take in the awesome atmosphere that each of these levels present, and Hitman 3 is no different, with having some amazing atmosphere in the levels like Dubai or Argentina. You walk around a bit and can see that you can interact with a lot of different objects, you can also pick up many items. Many of the glasses and plates in the levels can be poisoned, for example, but most are of course just random glasses from which the target NPC will never drink from. So the most that you can get is that you might poison a civilian NPC and hope for him to get sick so you might be able to knock him out and steal his clothes or an item that he's holding. Having actually so many random objects being interactable and poisoning them is also really important to have. Because let's say the game did not have this and the only drinks and food that you were able to poison actually were the ones that were only eaten and drank by the target, then it would defeat the sense of exploration since you already knew, ah, this is the food and drink that I need to poison. With how it's done here, it's always a bit of a guessing work, and that is what makes it all the more fun since you have to be sharp with your surroundings and anticipate what the target NPC does next. Now the items that you can pick up in this level vary from coins to soda cans or fruit, and these serve the purpose that you can throw them somewhere, and nearby NPCs will check it out to see what the noise was. You can also sometimes throw them at their heads, which will knock them out. This is a great way to separate an NPC from other civilians, so you can take them out silently, out of sight. Then other items you can pick up would function as weapons, like hammers, crowbars, screwdrivers, scissors, wrenches, kitchen knives, and more. Now picking up these weapons in the sight of certain NPCs might raise suspicions. After all, seeing a regular guest or maybe a tech staff pick up and walk away with a kitchen knife at a big event is indeed very weird. But let's say you manage to seal the outfit of one of the chefs. Then suddenly, it does not become that suspicious for you to take up the knife and can just do it in plain sight. It's little details like these that I really love, though of course it also messes a bit with your suspension of disbelief because to the game then, it's not suspicious at all for the chef character to walk around the entire perimeter with a knife out, which of course in reality would be very weird. What is also important to note is that some of the items you pick up don't only serve as a weapon, but can also unlock new abilities you can do, like puncturing water reservoirs at drinking spots with a screwdriver, or messing with tech if you have the same tool. If you manage to find and pick up a wrench, you can, as mentioned before, mess with gas canisters, or loosen valves or other equipment that might cause a malfunction or accident. What is cool too, is that not only can you find these items in the environment, but certain NPCs hold these items too, making it actually rewarding to deal with civilian characters as well, instead of just focusing on that one target. In one level in the club in Berlin, I wanted to mess with some equipment, but the game mentioned I was missing a screwdriver. And so I walked through the entire level looking for a screwdriver, but could not find a single one. I then took out one of the tech staff in a non-lethal way, and look and behold, that person had a screwdriver on him. So then I could finally get to business. And this goes for more NPCs as well. Some civilian NPCs that work at an event as a security guard or staff might have keys or key cards on them, which you can then just take and use to get to even more locations. So I would say that the first 20 or so minutes of each level are usually spent just walking around, taking in the atmosphere, and picking up items that might prove useful. Then it becomes important to assess in which areas you can and cannot go. Often doors you cannot enter have staff-only signs or even guards standing in front that will refuse your access. And so in order to gain access, you either need to sneak past them or, the preferred way, knock someone out and steal their clothes so you look like someone from security or staff so you can head on through without anyone raising an eyebrow. But even there, it differs who can go where, which means you often will have to switch outfits many times. A chef or waiter, for example, can head to the storage area, laundry, or the kitchen area, but is not allowed upstairs where a private meeting is being held. Upstairs, only security forces can go, and even then, still only up to a certain point. If you want to go even higher without anyone being suspicious, you would have to find a heavy security officer or personal royal staff and knock them out so you can then change into their outfit and have free reign there too. I also keep talking about knocking people out, but if you look hard enough, you sometimes find clothes you can just put on in areas like the changing room. And that is actually something I really need to commend these Hitman games for, is that often the item locations really make sense, which adds to the believability of the world. If you are looking for a tool like a wrench, crowbar or screwdriver, 
you will often not find them in areas like the kitchen or around the office. Instead, you will have to go to the storage area or the technical area where the handymen, of course, are doing their work. Same with poison. If you are looking for rat poison, you will often find it in areas where they store the food, instead of it just laying around somewhere random. This makes it fun to explore, since the experience does not feel as random as it could have been if the items were just spread around without logic. If you do manage to knock someone out and steal their clothes, it is also important to hide their bodies, because often civilians will just walk throughout the level and enter different rooms, so chances are pretty high of others finding the bodies. There are many places like dumpsters or closets in which you can put the bodies so no one will find them. But even with wearing the right clothes, you are still not 100% safe, and this is one of the coolest additions they made to the later Hitman games that something like Blood Money did not have. There are certain NPCs that will recognize which staff do and do not work at that location. And so even with a set of new clothes, they will notice that you are not an official hired person and will get suspicious. I love this addition because it makes sense. Often when you work somewhere, you of course know a lot of people, but not everyone. So it makes sense for some of the lower ranking security or regular staff not to shrug their shoulders if they see someone working there who they have never seen before. But maybe those responsible for recruiting or a higher rank of course are more familiar with the faces they see every day, and so to have them become suspicious when they suddenly see a new face makes sense and really adds to the strategy and tactics you need to use to avoid being detected. Now one thing that is very cool about the last three Hitman games is that you can customize greatly how difficult you want to play the game, and I turned almost all the HUD icons off for me. That means that normally you would actually see an icon above the head of an NPC who will see through your disguise. But I find that, to be honest, a bit too easy, and thus I turned that off. But the game still gives me a little bit of a hint through a sound cue that goes off, if I'm getting too close to someone who might know I don't work there. This customization is also what makes these Hitman games so good, and in the spirit of something like Blood Money. By default, those absolution mechanics like looking through walls are on, but thank god you can just turn it off and play the game like you did with contracts on Blood Money. You can even also turn off the map, turn off hints and even more to make it even more difficult than Blood Money. All I had turned on was the objective, so I knew the name of whom I had to kill and if I had already completed a certain objective or not, because sometimes there are also objectives like not involving killing uh, but instead finding a file, etc. Now what I described with how I approach a level, with the first exploring, then seeing what I can and cannot access, and after that starting to steal uniforms and slowly making my way to the target, might sound like it takes a long time, and it does. For 5 out of the 6 levels in Hitman 3 it took me longer than an hour to finish it. The China level pretty much took me 2 hours, but all in all I would say that the average time was often 70 to 75 minutes for me to complete it, making it an average length to complete for having only 6 stages. And maybe to some, having that patience to walk and look around or having it take so long might be off-putting. But even then, the game has you covered. You see, you can play like I described, with being very careful, staying out of sight, getting rid of all the evidence and bodies carefully, and going about it with a lot of finesse. If you just want to shred the target or blow him up, you can do that too. There's nothing stopping you from pulling out a gun and start shooting out in the wild. Do you not care about civilian casualties? then just pull out a machine gun and start spraying at the target even if they are in the midst of a huge crowd at the party. You will still complete your objective, and the only penalty will be your score if you care about such a thing. Now of course, in order to complete the level, you still need to run to the exit point, and if you start shooting, you of course trigger all the security to come and hunt you down. You will die quite quickly in Hitman, and so this will often result in a game over pretty fast. But you can also blow them up with a remotely detonated bomb. Either you can put it amidst a lot of civilians again, if you don't care, or maybe put a bomb in a room that the target will enter and blow it up without most of the civilians noticing. Chances are you will still kill their personal bodyguard and therefore will take a hit on your final score, but at least it's cleaner than killing all those civvies. Again, the possibilities almost seem endless with how you can kill your target and that is the strength of the Hitman games, is that you play it the way you want to play it. There are many games out there that state you can do this with their product, but in reality, choices that you make don't really make it a different experience. With Hitman, that is not the case. You want to go loud? Go loud, but suffer the consequences of alerting the security. You want to go stealth or up close and personal? Go stealth, but you have to take it a bit more time to prepare. 
What about using a sniper from afar, which will alert the security, but not necessarily to your presence if the shot is muffled or they don't know your location? If you picked up a kitchen knife or something sharp, you can stab the target instead of shooting them. If you expose a wire around a wet floor and turn on the electricity, you can electrocute the target if you time it right and make it seem like an accident. Again, the possibilities almost seem endless and it's so cool. Often when you play a level for the first time and explore, you will clearly see all kinds of fun opportunities and ways to kill the target, some even more hilarious or fun than the other. Maybe you can drop a chandelier on their head when they are having a phone call and stand under it, or finding an exploding golf ball, which will let them do the work for you when they want to practice their swing. Each time you stumble upon new opportunities, and it's fun to have this amount of choice and different ways to approach how to go about taking out the target. Now with the Hitman reboot, they also introduce story missions, and these are pretty cool scripted events that take place throughout the levels which can result in some of the most unique kills. They do often require a preset amount of requirements in order to fulfill them. Like stealing a board member's outfit alone is not enough. You need a certain document as well to prove it is you, and if you have both, then you can go ahead and continue that story mission event to the next step. Often these story missions have a lot of dialogue, which makes them stand out from an otherwise not dialogue heavy experience. Completing these story missions often can be a bit tricky since they require items that sometimes are very well hidden. If you play the game casually or with all the HUD hints on, the game actually literally spells it out for you what you have to do and where you have to go. And please, for the love of God, do not play the game like this. At least turn off those story hints because the game literally says go there to find this, then go here to meet this person, etc. And I have heard the phrase that the Hitman games play themselves. And if you follow those story hints like that, this is indeed the case. It takes away the fun of discovering the opportunities yourself. You will often find intel and reading the intel screen will give you some more background info or opportunity info without telling you exactly what you need to do. This way, you also stumble upon things by pure chance, and that joy of discovery stays intact. In the first Dubai level, I stumbled upon a conversation between a guest and a security officer who would not let this guest through. The guest was very angry in response, and said that he had an appointment with the royal sheik. When he got rejected again, and went for an angry smoke break, I managed to knock him out and see if he had something valuable on him. Turned out that this guest was an assassin sent out to kill someone upstairs. He had a gun and lethal poison on him. Grabbing the lethal poison then gave me new ideas and new opportunities to deal with my targets. And so I managed to steal a waiter's uniform and offered one of the targets a drink, which I had spiked with the lethal poison which killed him in an instant in front of his own daughter. Quite morbid, but felt very satisfying seeing my plan come together like that. I talked to a friend and said that he handled the situation completely different and instead kicked that same target off a railing of the building. And even another I talked to said that they drowned him in the toilet. It's actually a great game to talk about and discuss with your friends, since it might give you a perspective of how different a scenario can play out. It is a game where choices do truly matter and offer vastly different outcomes. It's one of the reasons why many people say Hitman games have great replayability. And they definitely do, since it's always fun to head back into a level and explore an area you haven't even been to yet to see if there's something new to discover there or see what other ways there are to kill your target. In the last three Hitman games, the game offers you with different starting positions and equipment possibilities to offer even more variety to this. You can also take on contracts set up by other people where your target will be someone else entirely and could be any random NPC in that level from a random staff member to a high-ranking security officer or even that assassin I talked about. Having all this to replay and stretch the enjoyment of the levels with does get appreciated and is very fun, but for me, the true core of Hitman still lies at playing each level for the first time and really taking your time exploring and contemplating on what to do next or how to go about things. Therefore, it's still a bit of a shame that each iteration only has six levels. Yes, as I said, they are huge and do take a long time to complete. But previous Hitman games had had more levels, and because you can go to such different places, it really adds to that much needed variety. That is what also so cool about Hitman, is that one level you can be at a villa of a narco boss in Mexico, and the next you are in an opera house in Paris with a completely different vibe and atmosphere, and after that New Orleans during a big parade. Now if you have not played Hitman 1 and 2, and instead we will be playing this trilogy as if it were one game, 
then I might actually say that that experience you have probably is even better than Hitman Blood Money, because 18 of these huge levels offer such great variety and cool locations and killing opportunities that it's an absolute must-play experience. I'm almost even jealous of those who have not played the first two and get to play the trilogy as if it were one game. But with the review, we are talking about Hitman 3, and thus we should only look at the levels that are offered here. Since the gameplay of Hitman is so similar to that of the previous two games, everything stands or falls with how good the levels are. It can actually be a valid critique that the game barely does anything new compared to its two predecessors, but to me that gameplay is still so enjoyable that I can look past that. But it's the levels that make it or break it. Hitman 1 and 2 each had a few levels that were so fun to play and explore that they reached legendary status amongst all the Hitman games. Sabienza, of course, from Hitman 1 is such an amazing level, which I still love to return to today, and also Miami and personally to me, the Vermont level in Hitman 2 are some of the best offered too. The levels that I often love the most are the ones where you're at a location with lots and lots of civilians where regular life is just happening. I'm not sure why, but to me there's just something so satisfying about preparing and executing a plan to take out a target amongst so many NPCs partaking in a party or other event, or just living out their lives, like in Sapienza. I think it's because of that that my favorites of the last few games are indeed Sapienza, Miami, and the one in Vermont, because it's just the town's people living out their lives, going shopping or visiting a neighbor's barbecue. Miami might be revolving around a racing event, but it still definitely lives and breathes that luxurious Miami vibe we all know from TV. I also should say that the one reason why I love that Vermont level so much is because I love the suburban level in Blood Money as well. The one where there's a birthday party and one can dress up as a clown. The Vermont level is clearly inspired by this, and even though it has less NPCs on the streets compared to maps like Sapienza or Paris, it still feels alive and super atmospheric. I think levels that don't hit that mark are for example Marrakesh, where the market itself is bustling with life and very cool to explore, but the two targets are in some of the most boring locations, namely a locked off embassy and the other an abandoned school building. But what about the levels in Hitman 3 then? We have a level in Dubai, in the countryside of England, at a club in Berlin, in the streets of a Chinese city and at a large party at a land house near a vineyard in Argentina. Well, first of all, I should say that the level design itself is once again superb. While playing Hitman 3, I had a revelation that may be one of the reasons why I love playing Hitman games so much, is because in some ways it has similarities to level design of, for example, a Deus Ex. If you cannot go through a door because you don't have the right tool or key, chances are there's another way to enter somewhere else, either by climbing a ladder and finding an unlocked door, or heading around and finding a vent or maybe an open window. Once again, you sometimes just stumble upon these discoveries, and it's so cool because your curiosity will often get the better of you, and you always find new things and places to go. The levels themselves are once again huge. Even a level that is entirely indoors, like the Dubai one, is still huge because there are like four or five floors you can explore, and each floor is very big, with one floor even having a full-on art exhibit on display, and multiple bars including one inside and a terrace outside. Then there's still the area of the helipad, there's the backstage area of the exhibit, or all the VIP sections or server and technical areas upstairs. What helps too in this level is the amazing atmosphere. So much thought went into the art design of this level and how everything looks and feels. The gold bar is this luxurious lounge with the beautiful gold art in the ceiling and everyone enjoying drinks and snacks with bottles of champagne being on display everywhere. The outdoor lounge is lit up with tiny lights creating a nice mood and having lounge chairs make it all the more of a quiet and relaxed vibe. There's also a tiny spot where there's an indoor oasis, with this beautiful tropic spot with white stones for a path between the green lush plants and palm trees. There are signs everywhere promoting the exhibit, and even the exhibit itself feels convincing with light shows going off and cheesy slogans and text being displayed on walls and other displays. The level is huge but full of detail. Same goes for the English level, which revolves around one single mansion, so one might think it's a tiny level, but you can walk around the perimeter for quite a long way and even head to areas like a greenhouse, a giant fountain, a labyrinth and more. The mansion itself is also really big and beautifully decorated, to the point where it's even prettier than the mansion in the Paris level of Hitman 1. 
There's also an amazing story mission here, where you can be a detective and solve a murder mystery in an homage to the game Clue. What's cool too is that the outcome of that mystery has different outcomes, so you can actually replay the level and have to solve a new mystery. In case you were wondering, I was not able to complete the mystery of mine. I only found four out of the six clues. I did end up smothering the target with a pillow, while she was letting off some anger in a soundproof secret room. And this actually comes to something where I think they can improve upon, and that is to make some of the kills a bit more visceral or impactful. I'm not talking about making the game more gory or bloody, but the smothering itself was Agent 47 basically holding the pillow on her face for two seconds, and then it was over. Another kill I made in a different level was I killed someone by having a mind control machine overcharge that person's brain, and that kill was also very underwhelming, despite me having to do a lot of steps in order to complete it. It wasn't that spectacular or satisfying, and having these underwhelming kills can feel like such an anti-climax after doing a lot of work. That's why definitely an advice for the next Hitman in a few years is to amp up some of these kills on how they look and feel. Again, this does not mean that all kills feel very underwhelming. In one kill, I threw a giant axe into the target's skull, which then got stuck in its face, which looked really gnarly and awesome. The third level, which is the Berlin Club, is the one that is visually the least interesting, but gameplay-wise it offers something cool where Agent 47 is being hunted by secret agents and you need to take out at least five of them in any way you want. There are more than five agents roaming around, so you can kind of choose who you go after and in what way. It all takes place near a nuclear power plant and at night, so that's why it's not visually all that impressive, but the indoors of the Shady Club do actually look very cool and impressive, and the music is pretty banging too. It also totally fits into that Hitman notion, as both contracts but also blood money have levels that take place in clubs. The fourth level is the Chinese city, and this is the only level I have mixed feelings about. I think with such a densely populated area like China, there could have been done a lot more, but the entire level is in the rain and at night, so the streets are not very crowded. There are a lot of buildings you can enter though, which is fun, but this is again one of those levels where the targets are in facilities. What's more is that one of them is dealing with mind control or something, and it's honestly a bit too much out there to take it seriously. It feels way too alien to where it stands out compared to other Hitman levels where you blend into an everyday crowd. Here you go from secret facility to secret facility and laboratories, and I much more prefer it if they stick to the everyday civilian situations. Maybe some players prefer these types of missions, because it kind of makes you feel like James Bond infiltrating an enemy facility, but I stick with the hiding in plain sight approach. I will say that there are some really cool story mission opportunities here, and also the level design is once again great, with many different routes and approaches to take. The Argentina level is also very cool and atmospheric, with Agent 47 partaking in a giant party at a land house near a vineyard. I do have to say though, that very early on you are able to steal a lawyer's clothes. This basically gives you free reign and easy mode in terms of where you can and cannot go. I was even able to barge into the security rooms as a lawyer, which I thought was very weird. That's why I spent the least amount of time in this level, because it was so easy to maneuver everywhere. Then the actual final level is a bit underwhelming, since it's very linear and small in nature, and revolves around you finding one-use only items like rusty crowbars and nails to unlock things with, and it was okay, but also nothing more than that. But in all honesty, that counts for a lot of the maps in Hitman 3. Many of the maps are good, but I don't think they will join the ranks of most legendary maps for Hitman games like Sapienza, the Opera Building from Blood Money, or the Miami level from Hitman 2. Probably the two most original levels in the game are the one in Dubai and the one at the British Mansion. They each have a very unique vibe not seen in many other levels, with the Dubai level taking place pretty much only inside on such a huge scale, and the British Mansion level feeling like you've stepped into a triple A version of the board game Clue. The Berlin level is okay, but visually just not too impressive. The Chinese level has too much time spent in the facilities, and I also did not like the ending escape section. And the Argentina one is fine, and just about that. I honestly feel that the levels in Hitman 1 and 2 were a bit more outstanding and unique in a way. Especially Hitman 2 offers such great variety and displays in levels with stages like Miami, Colombia, India, and Vermont feeling so distinctively different and fun to explore. Again, Hitman 3 levels are not bad, in fact far from it, but I also don't feel like they pulled the game stages to new heights. 
Finally, another critique point I want to give is this always online bullcrap that they have, and I believe that was already a thing with the first Hitman, but it's just something that really is not necessary and honestly kind of ruins part of the fun, because if the servers are unstable only for a second or so, the game will go to offline mode and you will not receive any score, experience, or progression in a single player game. I mean, what are you thinking? I also heard horror stories about people not being able to import their save file, their game constantly going in offline so they could not progress, etc. And I absolutely despise always online modes in single player games since it simply does not make sense to have it. Sure, you can maybe, you know, have some leaderboard interaction, etc. But to always be online for that is simply stupid. It honestly is something that makes Blood Money a better product despite being so much older. As said before, if you have not played Hitman 1 and 2 and instead will tackle these 18 levels as one big game, then the issue of Always Online will not nearly be such a downer as you just have so much awesome content and levels to play and clear. And even though I realize that for the first 20 or so minutes of this review it sounds like I'm only raving and raving about this game, in reality what I described was the overall Hitman experience and how it was for these games in this trilogy. That means that the same could be said for both Hitman 1 and 2 as well as for this one. Now granted, it was not a review of Hitman 1 and 2, and I do want to do a review on those two games in the future on the channel as well. But I can already tell you that my score for those games will be a tiny bit higher than Hitman 3, despite me really liking Hitman 3. I just think that in terms of levels, it's the weakest of the three, with probably two having the best, then one, and finally Hitman 3. The gameplay is pretty much the exact same in all these Hit3 Hitman games, so it's really the levels that set them apart. And so my only issue with the game that I have is that some of the kills can feel very underwhelming and the always online thing is just a real eyesore. The levels are great, but not exceptional. And in the end, Hitman 3 will get an 8.4. Now I do also have to mention that you can play this game in VR, of course, and though I did not play it that way, I can imagine the game being even more impressive in that state. You can probably safely add 0.5 points to the score when it comes to playing in VR. I definitely hope to one day play it that way, to soak up even more of the atmosphere, especially because you can play the older Hitman 1 and 2 levels in VR as well. The older Hitman games always let you choose between a first person view or a third person view, so to visit the world once again in a first person perspective is a welcome addition. Shame though, that you cannot do it with a vanilla game.